Hello. You're listening to Late Edition Crime Beat Chronicles, a product of Lee Enterprises. My name is Chris Lay, and I'm the podcast operations manager for Lee. With Late Edition Crime Beat Chronicles, we're presenting notable true crime stories as reported by journalists for the dozens of various Lee Enterprises owned publications from around America. For this first series, we're taking a short drive east of Tulsa, Oklahoma, to learn more about the state's most notorious cold case, the 1977 slaying of three Girl Scouts. The episode you're about to hear is the third in a six-part series, so head back to episode one and start from the beginning if this is your first entry to the show. What you'll hear first is audio from a series of articles, written and read by Tulsa World journalist Tim Stanley, that were published in 2017 to mark the 40th anniversary of the tragedy. After that, you'll hear a conversation between myself and Tim Stanley that expands on the story and explores his experiences reporting the series so many decades after the initial crime. It might go without saying, but given the subject matter here, there are some obvious content warnings to impart. While everything here would be fit to print in a newspaper, parents are still cautioned to give the episode a listen before sharing this with any youngsters. For now, though, here's Tim reading Chapter 3, which is titled Memories of the Trial. Sherry Farmer had not heard the words. They were spoken slowly and clearly enough. It was just that they wouldn't register. He said, Lori is dead. Where do you put that in your brain? There is no place. There is no place to put that, said Farmer, describing the moment she was told that her eight-year-old daughter, whom she'd hugged goodbye just the day before, had died at summer camp. For Farmer, everything that came later traces back to that moment. It was where the journey, as she calls it, began. The one that, one day, would see the wife and stay-at-home mom transformed into speaker and advocate, traveling far and wide to stand up for families of murdered children. But in the moment itself, she was none of that yet. In the moment, she was still just a young mother trying to grasp the unthinkable, that Lori, her bright, beautiful, brown-eyed girl, was gone. In some ways, that fact is not any easier to grasp even now, 40 years later, Farmer said during an interview recently. Lori was the first of her five children with Dr. Charles Bow Farmer. Lori is still missed, she said. She's still a part of our lives and always will be. As such, memories of her remain strong. Lori was very mature for her age, Sherry Farmer said. There were a lot of children around and they were all little. Lori was seven when our youngest was born. She was very protective and secure with looking after them. That maturity carried over to school. Lori, who had just finished fourth grade at Jinx Elementary, was a top student and had skipped second grade altogether. Despite being younger than her classmates, she continued to excel. It was the same with the Girl Scouts. Going to summer camp for the first time in June 1977, Lori wasn't worried about being the youngest participant in her session. As the day of departure approached, her anticipation only grew. There was one problem with the timing, though, Farmer said. Lori's ninth birthday, on June 18th, was going to fall while she was away. The family had never celebrated a birthday in which they weren't together, so Bo and Sherry had an idea. They would drive over to Camp Scott that day, a Saturday, and celebrate with their daughter at camp. At least that was the plan, Farmer said. With the tragic news of June 13th, everything had changed. One minute thinking about their daughter's birthday, the farmers suddenly found themselves making another plan for her funeral. Where do you put that in your brain? There is no place to put that. By March 1979, Oklahomans had had almost two years to wrap their brains around the story. But with the most anticipated trial in state history finally set to begin, they found themselves going back over all the narrative twists and turns. The capital murder trial of Jean Leroy Hart, who had pleaded not guilty in the deaths of Denise Milner, Lori Farmer, and Michelle Gousset, would be held in the third floor courtroom of the Mays County Courthouse in Pryor, with Judge William J. Whistler presiding. S.M. Buddy Fallis, Tulsa County District Attorney, was heading the prosecution team. 
He and his chief prosecutor, Ron Schaefer, had come on board to assist Mays County DA Sid Wise, who withdrew later after criticism for pushing a proposed book about the case. They were Tulsa girls. It was a Girl Scout group from Tulsa. That made a difference to us, Schaefer said in a recent interview, adding that he and Fallis felt a duty to step up. A widely respected veteran prosecutor, Fallis had made a name for himself prosecuting big-time Tulsa crime figures. Opposite him, leading the defense team, was attorney Garvin Isaacs from Oklahoma City. A relative unknown, at least compared to Fallis, Isaacs was a former Oklahoma County public defender who now had a private practice. He'd been recommended to Hart's family through an acquaintance and first met the accused in his cell at the Mays County Jail. First thing Hart said when we walked in was, I want you to know one thing, I didn't kill those Girl Scouts, Isaacs recalled recently. Those were the first words out of his mouth. I believed him when he said it. And a growing number of people apparently felt the same way. Following a marathon preliminary hearing in June and July 1978, it took about a month and was the longest preliminary hearing in state history, support for the defendant seemed only to increase. To raise money for Hart's defense, various efforts were organized, including a hog fried dinner in the Locust Grove area. Supporters wore t-shirts with slogans like, Stop the Mays County Railroad, reflecting the view that Hart was being railroaded or set up. Stepping in as well was the Cherokee Nation Tribal Council, which voted to donate $12,500 for Hart's defense. The council emphasized that it was not taking a position on Hart's guilt or innocence. It just wanted to help ensure he received a fair trial. On March 5th, 21 months since the murders, the trial finally began. Contributing to what was already a carnival or circus atmosphere, as news reports described it, major media from around the country flocked to Pryor. At the center of this hubbub was the county courthouse itself. Each day, up to two hours before the trial started, the would-be spectators began lining up. A Tulsa Tribune reporter, watching as they jostled in press, found himself wondering what it was about the explicitness and brutality of murder that had this effect on otherwise normal citizens. Whatever it was, three Oklahoma Highway Patrol troopers assigned to keep order had their hands full. Jury selection itself took 10 days, with more than 110 prospective jurors questioned. The 12, six men and six women who were ultimately chosen, represented occupations such as plant manager, gas firm foreman, school teacher, and housewife. Most were from Pryor or Adair. None were from Locust Grove. For the duration of the trial, the jurors would be sequestered at a prior hotel. For those onlookers lucky enough to get into the courtroom, their attention was riveted on Hart. Since his capture, he had undergone a striking transformation. Some murder suspects clean up, but they don't look right in the suits, recalled Tulsa World reporter Doug Hicks. But Hart, who wore a dark blue three-piece, looked like somebody you'd see on a college campus teaching English. Even his expression solemn and thoughtful, came across as professorial. Indeed, for a man at the center of such a firestorm, Hart was the picture of calm. The state's case hinged on two basic types of evidence. Biological, including hair and sperm samples found on the girls, which expert witness testimony linked to Hart, and items that could put Hart at or near the scene of the crime. These included a pair of sunglasses alleged to have been stolen from a Camp Scott counselor, a roll of tape that matched tape found at the death scene, and some photos linked to Hart, who'd once worked in a prison photo lab. The items had been discovered in a cave three miles from Camp Scott. Among other items linked to Hart were some recovered from the shack where he was captured. In all of this, though, the prosecution admitted it had no smoking gun. If Hart had been there, he left no fingerprints. And although biological evidence reportedly pointed to Hart, it could not do so conclusively. DNA testing would not be introduced until the late 1980s. Even so, the prosecution believed its circumstantial case was strong. For its counter strategy, the defense was going to, in essence, put the authorities and their investigation on trial. Setting the tone in his opening statement, Isaacs told jurors that the prosecution's case was all part of a grand design to convict an innocent man. Authorities, he said, had been out to get Hart from the beginning. To that end, he insinuated that the pieces of evidence recovered at the cave in the cabin had been planted. 
Making matters worse, Isaac added, and keying on Hart, they'd ignored more likely candidates. Namely, convicted rapist Bill Stevens, by then serving time in a Kansas prison. Stevens was a stronger candidate, Isaac said, and he produced witness testimony that he claimed supported that. For the families of the slain girls, sitting through the trial was an exercise in endurance. It was bad enough, Betty Milner said, hearing the graphic details of the murders, many of them for the first time. But worse still was how the trial was conducted. I was expecting something civilized, I guess, she said. I thought it would be about facts. It was like watching a movie, like everybody was performing. It was like the one who gave the best performance was the winner. Observers agreed with the performance metaphor. Punctuated from start to finish without burst between Isaacs, Fallis, and Judge Whistler, the Hart trial was courtroom spectacle at its finest. Both attorneys were called to the bench for frequent reprimands as tempers flared and verbal jabs were traded. Isaacs, described variously as flamboyant, colorful, volatile, and unpredictable in news reports, knew how to provoke a reaction, Schaefer said. Schaefer doesn't remember what the argument was about, but once, in the judge's chambers, he decided he'd had enough of the defense attorney. I invited him outside, he said, chuckling now at the memory. The only time in his career he challenged an opponent to fight, Schaefer added. Isaacs didn't take me up on it. It was probably better for me that he didn't. Meanwhile, with sentiment in support of Hart running so high, it was easy, Milner said, to feel alone as she sat in court, and out of the courtroom wasn't much better. People would come up to me on the street and say, Hart didn't kill your daughter, she said. The atmosphere was not hostile, but it wasn't far from it, recalled Beau Farmer, who attended every day with his wife Sherry. There was definitely subtle intimidation from Hart sympathizers. Even more disheartening, he said, was the experience of walking into local restaurants. You'd see jars collecting funds for Hart, he said. With one notable exception, Hart maintained his silence throughout. The exception came with the conclusion of jury selection after a surprise announcement from his attorneys. Hart, who repeatedly had shunned requests for interviews, was going to give a news conference, they said. Given the rules, questions had to be submitted beforehand and could not address the crimes, reporters pretty much knew they weren't going to learn anything of substance. But as it was Hart's first time to speak publicly since his arrest, nobody was going to miss it. The exchange went down much as expected. Hart offered little. He described himself as religious, a family man. He noted briefly that he could sympathize with the families. The point, of course, was to try to humanize the defendant. And to that end, most observers agreed, the move probably succeeded. He came across as intelligent, articulate, likable. A follow-up editorial in the Tulsa Tribune hammered the state's news media for agreeing to the terms of the interview. The media had allowed itself to be manipulated, it stated, and had rarely looked worse with its inane questions and fawning responses. Regardless, with the news conference over, Hart was done talking. He would not take the stand during the trial. On Thursday, March 29th, ten days after arguments began, closing arguments in the trial concluded. Hart's fate was now in the hands of the jury. For a case in which nothing had come quickly, most watchers assumed deliberations would be no different, possibly taking several days. The jurors deliberated the rest of Thursday, six hours, before retiring for the evening. They resumed on Friday morning. Then, just over half an hour in, word was brought to the judge. No one had expected it so soon. The jury had reached a decision. For the families of the three girls, every day of the past year and a half had been leading up to one moment, a courtroom verdict. As she waited for the jury to return, Sherry Farmer's thoughts drifted back to when it all started, June 13, 1977. It had been about mid-morning and she was home caring for Lori's siblings when her husband, Bo, arrived back from his overnight shift at the hospital. He came in through the back door and he looked awful, ghost white. I'd never seen him like that. It was her first sign that something was way amiss, she said. Then she noticed he wasn't alone. With him was his colleague, Dr. Lloyd Anderson. Anderson spoke first. He said, Sherry, you need to sit down. And I said, no, I'm not going to sit down. 
I had no clue it was about Lori, Sherry said. I didn't have any premonition about that, but I knew that my life was going to change with whatever he said next. Now, all these months later, it had come down to what a jury would say next. And whatever it was, Sherry knew, it was going to change her life again. She didn't have long to wait. When the jurors filed back in, the court clerk took their verdict and began to read aloud. The cheers began to break out after the first not guilty. Two more followed that one. Sherry buried her face on Bo's shoulder while around them the courtroom erupted. A couple of hours later, and the scene had shifted dramatically for the farmers. The crowds were gone, the media melted away. No lights, no cameras, no slamming gavels. It was just Sherry and Bo by themselves, standing in a quiet cemetery. Kneeling, Sherry touched the grave marker, fingers tracing the letters in her daughter's name. I said to Lori, I guess we failed, Sherry recalled. I had made the promise when we buried her that I would do everything I could to see that whoever did this was punished. But here we were. We had no answers. We don't know what happened. Sherry wasn't done making promises, though. Then and there, she whispered another, sure that her daughter was listening. I told her, I won't stop trying. What you just heard was the third of six articles written in 2017 by Tim Stanley for the Tulsa World, as read by the author. All those articles can be found at TulsaWorld.com, presented with incredible new photos alongside images from the newspaper's archives, and you should absolutely go check those out. Links to those and other relevant content can be found in the show notes. After a short pause, we're going to go to a conversation between myself and Tim, that was recorded just last week. Yes, yeah, so that was uh, chapter three, which is titled Memories of the Trial. Yeah, I've, uh, I like last time, I tried to do a little reflection and uh, just... Uh put some thoughts together on, you know, what might add value, you know, for the listeners, what we can say that's not necessarily already said. The first thing that jumped out to me was, and again, you're, you're using the, the framing device of, you know, starting and, and closing this chapter in a similar way as you did the last one, where we, we get to meet uh, Sherry Farmer, the mother of Lori Farmer, one of the victims. Do you remember how you determined which profile of of the family's grief maybe you were going to use for the articles as they were laid out in the structure between you know articles one through six? Yeah, there was uh, there is that wasn't random. This is the story where we uh, we introduced the farmer family, and um, you know we haven't uh, they have not appeared uh, you know really in the first two stories. Um, other than just, um, you know, mentioning uh, Lori. Really what led me to start with the Milners in story number two and sort of use them to frame that one was, you know, just the simple fact that we were able to get an interview not only with Betty, um, you know, Denise Milner's mother, but also with uh, Michelle Hoffman, who was, uh, you know, a counselor at the camp. She was actually, I think, what they would consider a counselor in training. She would have been a counselor the following summer, just to clarify on that. But one of the many things that Michelle brought to this project was she had some direct contact and thus direct memories of Denise, you know, on Denise's last day on Earth. Well, she might have been you know, the last person to communicate with her. May very well have been. Um, but she also, you know, she was able to talk about meeting Betty and Denise, you know, as they were getting on the bus, of riding down and sitting with Denise um, and, you know, kind of forming a little bit of a bond there with her and then just kind of checking in on her uh, later at the camp and keeping an eye out on her. To me, that was really important uh, to be able to include in the story because it, it puts us right there 
lets us through Michelle's eyes um, kind of see Denise. And, you know, we just we didn't necessarily have that kind of a connection for Lori or for uh, Michelle with Denise, you know, and with Michelle's uh, with her interview. I just, you know, I felt like that was a, a good place to start because, you know, we could really uh, through Michelle, you know, sort of connect with Denise. And so it just it became kind of, uh, you know, just logical to to lead off story two since we had already introduced Denise through Michelle to then start with Betty, uh, Denise's mother, and, you know, sort of uh, bring it all back to, you know, the people most directly affected, and that is, that is the family. And so we started with Betty to be able to talk to, talk about Denise and, and just what that loss was about. And so with uh, the Farmer family, I wanted to bring them in next because the Gousset family had opted not to participate directly. They don't do interviews anymore. That was a, a personal family choice that they had made, you know, probably 20 years ago. I think you had said that they were willing to work with you on background or as fact checking. Exactly. Yeah. And that was uh, Richard Gousset uh, or Dick, as he was known, who I, and I don't know if I mentioned it, who has since passed away, but he's like, you know, that's something we've decided that it's just not in our family's best interest anymore. We did the interviews at one time. But I, all of that to say, clearly with us having a relationship with Lori's family and them participating, that made more sense uh, for Lori to be next. And then we just, we, we definitely wanted to uh, include Michelle in a similar way. How that ended up working out was, it's not the next story, but in story number five, that one will be framed with some memories from Richard Gousset that were called from a previous interview that we did with him many, many years ago so that we already had that for that story. We didn't necessarily have to have a, a new interview with the family because uh, what he had to say and, and those previous comments actually served our purpose as well. And so we were also able to, uh, to get Michelle in there and just kind of uh, let people know a little bit more about her using that means. So Story three and just how it was all working out seemed like the right place, you know, to bring Lori's family into it. And they had some very direct and vivid memories of the trial because they were there every day. And Betty Milner was as well, I think, for most of it. But uh, I, you know, they had some real compelling memories that also really just fit with this story. And you mentioned, I mean, the other families. One of the things that I took away from this third article was the tremendous sense of loneliness that the families felt in the courtroom as well as in the town when it turned out that there were people vocally you know sticking up for Hart i think uh Lori Farmer's father talking about going into restaurants and seeing you know donation bins for for Hart did the other families mention that similar feeling? From what I know about the Gousses, uh, just from previous articles, I think their experience was very similar. Betty Milner, I think, you know, hers was similar as well. I think they all kind of experienced that. You can begin to imagine just how incredibly difficult and complicated this whole scenario was. Because, you know, not to fault, you know, the people in Locust Grove or in Mays County who, who sided, you know, with Hart and his family, um, they had their reasons for doing that. And, you know, at the end of the day, maybe they were right. Um, but we'll talk more about, you know, the case itself and, and Hart as we go along. But, I, you know, I don't know how you make that situation easier for the families. I will say that, well, and again, I'm going to get a little bit ahead. Sherry Farmer will be involved after this case in some advocacy efforts that sort of will change that situation for families and help them have a place to go to where they don't have to be necessarily exposed to that. So I, I can't imagine that this experience, in fact, I'm sure it did, sort of influenced her in that for victims' families and, and their rights and, and giving them a place, you know, that they can be comfortable. We'll talk about that. That comes up in a couple of stories from now. And as we, you know, talk to Sherry and, and you know, the things that came out of this for her. 
it seems like just uh, incredibly difficult, defies words really for your grieving family seeking justice and just everywhere you turn, everywhere you look in this particular setting, there's just something, it's the old place seems against you. I'm sure that's not true. I mean, I'm sure there were certainly people there that were sympathetic to the families and, and maybe even uh, agreed or believed that Hart was guilty. But when you're a family in an emotionally vulnerable position like that, I mean, it's going to feel like everybody's against you, you know? And uh, I think definitely, you know, many people were. And that's just, uh, and that's sad, but you know, that's kind of the reality of what's an incredibly difficult case. And you definitely described the trial itself, or you, you know, communicated that the trial was described as being a circus, a carnival, which was uh, kind of goosed by both the the prosecution and the defense, and it kind of it got off pretty much from the get-go, it sounds like, with Sid Wise, who was one of the prosecutors, having to walk away from the whole thing because he had a book deal? Yeah, let's talk about that. That was one of the things <laughs> that they wanted. I mean, everywhere you turn in this story, there's there's something crazy. But I, um, a little context, and because one thing that people will wonder, you know, about this case and about the trial itself is why did uh, a Tulsa County district attorney come to Mays County to head up the prosecution. And we're talking about Buddy Fallis from Tulsa. I mean, didn't Mays County have their own prosecutor? Absolutely, they did. And his name was Sid Wise. Uh, probably the best way to put it um, is that he, he really sort of had compromised himself during the investigation and had become a focal point of heavy criticism. Yes, purportedly he had uh, teamed up early on in the investigation with a local reporter to write a book about the case, you know, which is just, I mean, yeah, I, it's hard to wrap your head around, but apparently this was going on. He'd been accused of feeding this reporter confidential information during the investigation and, you know, for this book. And just as a side note, no book ever came out. Yeah, not by him, but, um, there were some news articles that came out in both the World and Tribune, you know, about this situation. So what happened was Sid Wise initially brought Fallis, Buddy Fallis from Tulsa in, in a supporting role, but eventually he chose to bow out and just hand off the reins. And, it, and he doesn't say this. He didn't say it then, but I'm guessing that, you know, he probably felt he had to do that. Uh, he had to back out because his public image had been so tarnished by that point. And we talked, you know, Chris, last time we talked about some of the factors that may have sort of predisposed many folks in Mays County to be sympathetic toward Gene Hart. This situation here certainly didn't help, you know, the prosecution. And it just, it kind of would, I think, probably contributed uh, to this already general distrust for those in authority, um, it sort of suggested that, uh, you know, these guys have their own personal agendas here. So this situation, as you could see, didn't exactly inspire confidence in the public that, you know, the guys in charge were trustworthy. Um, so that's some of the backstory on that. We didn't go into a lot of detail, but what it set up was a really, really interesting squaring off, I guess would be a good word for it, between Buddy Fallis, who was well known throughout the state. He was, you know, the Tulsa prosecutor. He'd been, he was a veteran uh, prosecutor. He'd had many cases. He was the guy who, you know, never lost a case. The guy who always got his man, you know, that was very much his reputation. Well, you said he'd taken on crime figures. I mean, like, it sounds like, yeah. You know, organized crime. Organized crime absolutely had some of that in his background. Just looking at this on the face of it, you would think, wow, I mean, so the prosecution uh, is really sitting pretty here. I mean, they've got probably the best guy to do it. Sid Wise has stepped away. And it really, it looks going in like, you know, it's going to be a major mismatch because this is where you, in the story that we introduce a another guy who is going to be one of the most pivotal characters in this whole saga. And uh, that is uh, 
the defense attorney, Garvin Isaacs. Um, he was at the time uh, a young guy, unknown. You know, he was the opposite of Fallis in that regard. I mean, he just he was, uh, I think, based in Oklahoma City. Garvin was, uh, I think he was from small town Oklahoma, not from that area. I think he was out in the western part of the state. But he had uh, kind of made a name for himself as a college basketball player. He went to uh, <laughs> Texas Christian University, which now would be a Division One school. He was, uh, he was pretty tall um, and uh, lean and could be kind of an imposing figure, I think. But he was, uh, he was green. You know, he didn't have uh, he didn't have much going for him as far as experience. But I mean, he made up for it in gumption, you know. But you you did have you did have going in again. You had these two guys squaring off. I mean, and, and it looked like you know really what chance did Isaacs have, and by extension, you know what chance did Hart have. So I think, I mean, Garvin will factor into a couple more of the stories. I had a chance to to interview Garvin. In person, I uh, went down to Oklahoma City. He's still uh, practicing law. He is an interesting guy, to say the least. He is. Uh, this was his launching pad. This this case. He went on to even bigger things. He's uh, he's a past uh, president of the Oklahoma Bar Association. Um, he's still well known in his field and still practicing. And he's still proud of this case. He was happy to talk about it. Um, not to rehash what everyone has just read about or, or listened to on the podcast as far as the details of the trial. But I mean, it just, you know, this looked like such a mismatch. You have, to, and everybody is wondering, you know, how did Isaacs pull this off? I mean, he got his, he got his guy acquitted. And what I want to say about Garvin, and it's something I, I can attest to having sat down with him. I, you know, there was a, uh, there was a Netflix miniseries, not uh, it's been a few years back, called "The People versus O.J. Simpson," with the docu series uh, about the O.J. Simpson trial. And in that in that series, uh, Simpson's attorney Johnny Cochran is played by the actor Courtney Vance, I believe. And uh, um, Cochran, as as they are as he and his legal team are preparing to go in to the courtroom on the first day of the trial, he's given them like a pep talk. Um, and one of the things he says really, really stuck in my mind, I, so much so that I wrote it down. And what, what he said to them was, he said, jurors go with a narrative that makes sense. We are here to tell a story. We must tell ours better than they tell theirs. And a trial is, in a sense, a storytelling competition. And the side that tells a story that makes the most sense to the jury, that, that resonates, will ultimately win the day. I can tell you that having interviewed, you know, Garvin in person, he is a gifted, engaging storyteller. And I think the story that he told uh, in this case, in which he, he painted, you know, Gene Hart as the ultimate underdog, this, this long suffering victim who again was being set up to take the fall by you know, corrupt law enforcement, lazy law enforcement. I think that story resonated. Now, I want to be clear. I don't think that necessarily says anything about that particular jury. I think every human being, rightly or wrongly, tends to see themselves, we all do, as an underdog in some way. And so I think that angle could resonate with any jury. And furthermore, Garvin, for what it's worth, he played up his own underdog role. I mean, really played it up. Here he was, this rookie lawyer going up against the big city prosecutors. I mean, as he described it himself to me uh, when I interviewed him, he said, you know, why there I was, just a hick from the sticks, you know, going up against, uh, you know, these slick guys. And he, you know, that was the persona, you know, that he carried throughout that trial. And I mean, connecting with the jury and, and suggesting to them, you know, that, hey, this guy's one of us. And he's just a regular guy. Now, none of the jurors, you know, would ever say that, that you know, that played any part. That Garvin's personality, that the picture that he painted, the narrative that he, he created, they never said that was why they made the decision they did. But it's also in, in the article, you outline what the defense was, which, I mean, honestly, to my ears, was pretty 
slam dunk in and of itself where Garvin suggested another person who could have done it, a potential likely suspect who was overlooked or disregarded by the police and the real lack of, of any smoking gun of any at the time, you know, what would have been scientifically definable DNA evidence. That's one thing we probably ought to point out too, you know, while we're talking about DNA and that's going to come up later in the series too. But for people who aren't aware, this, this is the pre DNA era. And, you know, we're still in this, this was 1978. I mean, we're still probably 10 to 12 years away from DNA technology being available to law enforcement. So biological evidence at that time in the late seventies, you could, I think, you know, narrow targets down, but you couldn't necessarily pinpoint with the kind of accuracy that you have. now. You have hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what happened here. If you go to our website, there is a, there is a, a sidebar that kind of breaks down the evidence uh, and the witnesses a little bit, just to kind of give you a, a little clearer picture. But speaking to what you just said, you know, about, the way biological evidence could be used at that time. I think overall, this was a decent circumstantial case, but it was a circumstantial case. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I will say, you know, there have been stronger circumstantial cases where a defendant was still acquitted. There have been weaker ones where they got a conviction. I think this was a winnable case, but it certainly was no slam dunk. And I think... The perception going in for the general public, especially with Fallis, you know, taking charge, I, I think most people thought that this was a slam dunk and it just wasn't. And, you know, for the jury, they were roundly criticized outside of Mays County, particularly in Tulsa after this, and it implied that they were a bunch of homers. I think, I think we need to be clear about a few things. And one is that none of the jurors were from Locust Grove. None of them were Native Americans. I mean, because we talked about last time that those kind of two general groups would have been where you had the most sympathy for heart. But none of that was represented on the jury. These were just, they were from elsewhere in Mays County. So I, you know, I don't buy necessarily that, you know, that they were homers or that they were going to go with the hometown guy no matter what. I, that just, that doesn't make sense to me. But you know, one of the jurors said afterwards that the case just didn't make, meet their expectations. Yeah. I mean, all that Isaacs has to do is create a reasonable doubt. And I, you know, I think he, he was success, obviously, you know, he was successful in doing that. Now I will say, you know, the jurors said afterward that they kept thinking as the prosecution laid out its case, that something bigger was coming, that they were going to have something bigger. And they didn't use the word smoking gun, but uh, you know, get, you get the sense that they were they were wanting something like that. They never did get that, so they went the direction they did. Now, there are there are people who say, I mean, I think the families even, you know, of the jurors that you know, a couple of them at least, after the trial, and we talk about how the courtroom erupted um, in Hart's favor. There are people who say they saw jurors, you know, openly congratulating. Art and his family um, embracing, you know, like they've been friends all along or something. You know, I, I don't know about that. Obviously, I wasn't there. Um, I think, you know, there probably maybe was some of that. Here's what I'll say and, and probably leave it at this for the jury. I don't believe you should judge a jury, so to speak, until you've sat where they've sat and heard the case as presented to them. I don't think reading a summation of the case, you know, in the daily paper, that's not the same as being in, in one of those chairs. Or in the room where they're deliberating. Exactly. We, where we don't even have access to. I think that's probably where I'll leave it as far as, you know, the jury goes. I will say we, we tried. Uh, it would have been great to talk to one of those former jurors. And we did uh, kind of curry comb <laughs> the the countryside trying to find someone, uh, the ones that we were able to at least track down were already deceased. I, you know, it's one of those things you come back to on this. I, I think doing this series on the 40th anniversary, you absolutely didn't want to wait. I mean, the 40th, if you were going to do something like this, that was the time to do it because you had, I mean, the longer you wait, the more 
people have passed on, the, the fewer voices you're going to find. I think we did a really good job of finding a lot of, of voices um, from a lot of different points of view. But as far as finding a juror, we were not successful. Uh, I remember talking to one woman whose husband, I think, had been an alternate. And she said, oh, he would have been happy to talk to you, but he had just passed away, you know, a few months before. And so we kind of ran into that. So we just had to kind of look back and see what the jurors said. And they, they didn't have a lot to say, uh, you know, as reported in the papers at the time. But like I said earlier, it was just that, you know, really, I mean, they had expected more, you know, evidence wise from the prosecution and they just didn't get it. So. When you were talking to some of the, uh, the people who were the, the same age as, as the victims when the trial was going, um, the other, you know, people that were at the, the Girl Scout camp, like Hoffman, did any of them have any memories of the trial? Um, Hoffman was not there. She participated in the preliminary hearing, but I think she gave a taped de deposition. I, I do know that one, let's see, at least four of the counselors were called on to testify. And one of those, um, Carla Wilhite, you know, we did interview. And uh, Carla was very, I, she was very kind to talk to us. It was clearly still a very, uh, a very difficult thing for her to revisit. And all these, all these counselors, I mean, I think Michelle, I think she was 17. These other counselors were probably 18, 19, 20. I mean, they were still really just kids, you know, uh, adults legally, but still very young. And, you know, it's something we'll talk about in one of the later episodes or afterward is, is how they too carried the weight of this trauma for years. And yet nobody seemed to care about their part in this and what it, it did to them. I mean, I think, you know, Michelle would end up suffering from PTSD, be diagnosed with that and was directly connected according to doctors to this experience so these guys, um, these young women, uh, they, they carried a lot of guilt with them, as you might imagine, um, because they, they were in charge and, uh, you know, felt in some way responsible for not for not protecting those girls. So I yeah, I don't um, I don't remember talking to Carla uh, about her um, experience in the trial. I think I think we focused more on her experience at the camp during the events themselves. Cause Carla, I believe was the one who discovered the bodies just to, you know, add to her trauma. I mean, can you imagine? If you want to, wanted to talk about the cave, I didn't know if that was a place that you or the, the photo crew from Tulsa world went to. There are three caves that were critical to the investigation, three caves in that area, that general area within, you know, anywhere from a mile to a few miles of, of the Girl Scout camp. Part, uh, you know, was connected, traced, or was believed to have used those caves off and on, you know, as he was uh, living life as a, you know, a fugitive in the wilds. One of those caves, I mean, it's called a cave, but what it was, it's another part of the circumstantial case against him. But, you know, he, his boyhood home was probably within a mile of the Girl Scout camp. So, I mean, this, this was definitely his terrain, his territory. But the house itself no longer existed. Uh, what was still there, uh, I think in addition maybe to the foundation, was... I think what had been at one time used as a root cellar by the family. And uh, it was like a recessed area, you know, in the earth, I think is typically what those cellars are like. So it had come to be kind of more like a cave because uh, the house itself was not there. And so when they refer to the cave, I think that's the one that would have been closest to the camp. So items that, uh, you know, were later connected to heart were recovered from that site and it made sense that that might be a place, too, that he would use because, I mean, it was his old home. 
but we never uh, we never were able to. I think that was probably outside of the scope of what we could do. We were very happy to get access to Camp Scott itself, and um, we did not venture very far from there. In fact, I don't know if it would even be possible to find uh, those caves anymore. But that, you know that property was maintained, you know, at the time, you know, that it was an actual functioning camp. But it it has since, you know, without anyone to maintain it. I mean, it's really been reclaimed by the wilderness. I mean, so it's even more dense and um, thick wilderness. So those are some sites I, I definitely would have liked to have seen. Um, I'm not sure how we would have pulled that off. That would have been that would have been a pretty big <laughs> expedition. We probably would have needed to hire some uh, professional guides and uh, to get that. But they those sites definitely uh, played a big role, you know, in this case because they were sites that he was known to use, and they were all within pretty easy walking or hiking distance, you know, of the camp. Is there any audio of of Hart? with the the one public statement that he made or any video uh, from any local news or I mean, national or, you know, worldwide news that covered. Uh, there may well be. We didn't have any. The Tribune didn't have any. That was a different age, you know, for, for print newspapers. You know, nowadays, yes, absolutely. There would be a ton of it. You know, I'm guessing that probably the TV stations in Tulsa probably would. I will say, I'm glad you brought that up, though, because I think it is worth mentioning that uh, this kind of absurd press conference that, you know, was held right in the middle of the trial. Another Garvin, I mean, that was his idea. And it was kind of, uh, you know, the media really jumped at this opportunity. And I think it was just because you suddenly had this man, this this controversial figure, suddenly made available to you when that has not been the case, you know, for the entirety of, of your coverage, even since he's been, you know, captured and in jail, they'd had no access. And so they really, they really went in for it. And I think many of them came to regret it because it was very much a stage managed thing. Uh, They were confined to some softball questions, just stuff like how's jail treating you? (laughs) I mean, how are the meals? I mean, really was on that level. And I think a lot of them left frustrated and then, you know, I think that it was the Tulsa Tribune that actually wrote an editorial probably just after that, crit- criticizing the media roundly for participating in, in that press conference, because clearly it did not. Uh, um, well, you know, in the end, I think it probably accomplished what Isaacs in his cagey way wanted from it. I don't I, it did not affect the jury, obviously, because they didn't have access to it. They weren't there and they were sequestered. They wouldn't have been reading about it in the paper. But it was another one of those things that I think maybe, I mean, since the, everybody in the media covered it, it was another one of those things that sort of shaped public opinion. I think it was sort of like, you know, Isaacs saying, you know, you guys have wanted to see him. Well, here he is. I'll show him to you. See, look, he's got nothing to hide. Here he is. Yeah, but it's also done in a way that the you know reporters are blocked from asking any real questions. So there isn't any real good faith. There was no news value to it at all. I mean, the media kind of got used. And so Hart got to at least be seen. And, you know, he was dressed very nicely. And, uh, you know, he was polite. And so, you know, I don't know. I, it certainly didn't affect the trial or the outcome of it. So I'm not sure what, what Garvin thought. I, that's one thing I, I, you know, I would ask him if I was talking to him again is, you know, what exactly did you hope to accomplish staging that when you did? I could see if you'd done it, you know, maybe before the trial, you know, at an earlier time, but, you know, right in the middle of it. And why the judge allowed that is it's also curious. Not to be too, too cynical about it, but I mean, it does seem like the only person who came out ahead after this trial was Garvin Isaacs. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that'd be fair to say. I mean, I don't see how he could deny that. I mean, you know, it's it's just a, a well-known fact that if you're a young up-and-coming defense attorney, if you can latch on to a, a high publicity case, that that can advance your career. I mean, it may be cynical to say so, but that's, you know, that's just part of, that's the way it works. Um, and I think Garvin certainly saw an opportunity here. I don't hold that against him. 
Um, yes, I mean, that's kind of all that I've got. I didn't know if there was anything else that you had that that came up for you that was, you know. I think we pretty much hit on everything that I'd kind of um, prepared to speak to. I did definitely want to bring up that press conference because, and and we'll this will come up later, but um, you know he only made two two effectively two public statements because he was always unavailable to the media and then declined interviews, but this one was at least something. I mean the substance of it may have been nothing, but there is going to be one other interview he does. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about it when the time comes. It, I think it's uh, probably two or three days before he died. You know, he gave an interview to a paper called the, uh, the Cherokee Phoenix. That's a publication affiliated with the, the Cherokee Nation tribe. So he did give an interview, fairly lengthy one, with the Cherokee Phoenix. I think they published it in full. And then some of the area papers like the Tulsa World and the Tulsa Tribune, you know, went in and, and excerpted parts of it, you know, to report on. But we will uh, we'll leave that one uh, for maybe next time. Uh, I will say that 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 interview, even though, you know, it probably I mean, it was fairly softball <laughs> in its own way. He has a lot more to say. And I think uh, maybe at least a couple of things are kind of illuminating about him. So. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll save that one for next time. Certainly, yeah. And the um, the next one, uh, chapter four, is titled "Unanswered Questions." So we'll be back with uh, me asking you questions, which which you will be answering. <laughs> yes, I'll do my best. Been doing great so far. Thank you for tuning in to Late Edition Crime Beat Chronicles. There's a lot more where that came from just over the horizon, so make sure that you are subscribed to the show wherever you listen to your podcasts. As I said earlier, there are a ton of incredible additional resources you can explore on the Tulsa World site, tulsaworld.com, which I'll have links to in the show notes. This program was produced, recorded, and edited by me, Chris Lay, with tremendous thanks to Tim Stanley and the rest of the team at Tulsa World for the work that they put in reporting the series in 2007 and so many years ago before that. For Lee Enterprises, I'm Chris Lay. Do you know an army mom who deserves an extra special gift this Mother's Day? Order a commemorative brick to be placed in her honor on the grounds of the National Museum of the United States Army in Alexandria, Virginia. You can personalize the brick with the perfect message and even order a replica to have as a keepsake. Order now and her brick will be installed by Veterans Day. Remember mom's service in a way that will last forever. Design your brick and place your order at armyhistory.org. That's armyhistory.org.